10. 10. It's been like a Mac in my old days. I, before being a, a dice dealer, actually. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Dice dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I used to play in bands, so I've done it all. Yeah. Um, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to share a little bit of my work um, that focuses on trying to build uh, better communities. And of course, the foreclosure crisis is a real challenge to uh, accomplishing uh, this task. Um, when we talk about the foreclosures and the impact they have on, uh, on people, there's different ways we can approach this question, right? An economist might ask about what effect do foreclosures have on home values, this sort of thing. A psychologist might ask what effect do uh, foreclosures have on this, the operating of, of households and how they deal with these things. My interest is a little different. I study neighborhoods, I study neighborhoods and communities and people in these neighborhoods. So for me, what's particularly interesting about the foreclosure crisis, in a perverse sort of way, is the, the impact it has on these neighborhoods, if you will. That we can think about the foreclosure crisis as sort of an external force that comes in and impacts neighborhoods. Um, for me, that's something that's important to be aware of and something to um, to study. So even the person who isn't directly affected in the sense that they lose their home, um, to what extent do people nearby losing their homes, to what extent does that matter for them? And I'm going to suggest, just in my brief talk here, that there's, there's all sorts of impacts that that does indeed have on other people. I kind of view this, we might think of this as sort of a social storm, if you will. You can think of the analogy, we talk about hurricanes. A hurricane comes, it hit land, hits land, it has an impact on people. Um, and we might even talk about the severity of it, right? A, a category one hurricane has a minor impact, a category three or four or five, a much bigger impact. Well, in this case, I view this as, as a social storm, if you will. We could think about this foreclosure crisis. Of course, we could, we could have talked about how it came about, what was all involved in it, but for people living in neighborhoods who are the people I study, they're kind of, they're, they're separated from that. They're just living their lives and all of a sudden coming down the, the pike, if you will, is this, this crisis and what impact that has on them and their lives. Um, I'm going to use the term diffusion as a way of thinking about this. You think when a foreclosure happens, it just doesn't get there and stop, but in fact, it spreads out and impacts others. And the question is, who all um, does it impact? Um, a graduate student of mine helped me with this. Uh, I'm going to show you a series of maps here. These are This is zip code data. Uh, uh, quarterly data for Southern California over an eight-year period um, that we're showing, of course, that shades of red show higher foreclosure rates. To orient you, this is Orange County. We're down somewhere around here. This is LA County, and then San Bernardino and Riverside County. And then we can move forward in time, seeing what effect it has. Now, what I'm going to emphasize is that it's not just random where these red spots pop up, but there's actually a spatial patterning to it. Um, there's what you might think of as a, a diffusion process. Areas closer to others are more likely um, to get hit by it. Um, as we're moving now into 2006, 2007, you start to see the real impact of this taking place. You can see where it's happening. A lot of it tends to be out in the further reaches of the Southern California region. Um, but nonetheless, it's areas next to one and others are being impacted by this. Um, and again, on this, we're, we're using zip code data. You know, I study neighborhoods, and zip codes are, are way too big. We, I try to do work getting much more precise. But even with this, we see this, this pattern, this impact. By the time 2009 hits, the foreclosure rate's about 13 times higher than it was. And, and that's a tough guess, right? Because some argue that there's a, a bit of a bottleneck, that it, the worst is still yet to come. So what are the consequences of this for people living in neighborhoods? Well, for those who are impacted directly and lose their home, of course, huge impact. But for me, what I'm really interested in is the consequences for their neighbors. Um, for one thing, we can talk about this. There's this unprecedented scale for it. And this is a challenge for neighborhood scholars like me, because you know I've studied the effect of vacancies on people. But what happens when we have it on such a huge scale? Do our theories and our understanding of these problems really hold up in a case like that? 
Um, as well for neighbors, there's the issue of physical disorder that can take place. This can happen you know, even before we see um, a house be repossessed. You know, people start falling behind, they don't have the money, they can't afford upkeep on a home. That can cause a home um, to slide into uh, what, what criminologists refer to as physical disorder. Why do we care about that? Well, in part, the house maybe doesn't look as nice, that is, but it has other important consequences, we argue, that impacts people's perceptions of how the neighborhood's going. Some criminologists argue that that can lead down the road to more crime in the neighborhood. There's a consequence of that. Um, so it's an important issue to consider. Other consequences, home values, of course, just by the proximity, the supply and demand of homes coming on the market. Neighborhood satisfaction, neighborhood cohesion. I've done a lot of work, and others as well, in this looking at the effect of vacancies in areas on people's perception of the neighborhood, their satisfaction with it, their sense of cohesion. And neighborhoods are, in a sense, a collectivity of sorts. When everything is going fine, you don't think about it. I have my home, I live in it, everything's okay. But when things start going bad with the neighborhood, suddenly there's awareness we're kind of all in this together. And that's a bit of a challenge in a case like that. Residential mobility in response to um, foreclosures is an issue as, as well. What predicts where foreclosures, um, where they'll happen? You saw those maps before. We did a very simple statistical model where we just said, OK, if we know where foreclosures are this quarter, what predicts where they occur next quarter? Very simple little statistical model, but what was most notable, we found, is what we didn't find. I do these types of models a lot, and usually the best predictor of tomorrow is today. Right? If you ask me which neighborhoods will have the highest crime rates next month or next year, I'll say, well, tell me which ones have the highest crime rate this year. It's not very brilliant, right? You're not very impressive, but um, I, I, would be, I would do a pretty good job predicting it. What we found here is that wasn't the case. It was the case that neighborhoods with more foreclosures had a higher foreclosure rate the next quarter, but that wasn't the biggest effect by a long shot. What was far more important was foreclosure rates nearby in surrounding areas. Much, much bigger effect. Not even close. So this notion of a diffusion thing. So where foreclosures happen matters where they happen nearby. We also found that the foreclosure rate in the city had an important effect as well. Um, other things we were able to look at with this LA data, foreclosures, um, affect home values the next quarter. Not terribly surprising, but they do have an impact that way. What about crime? This is something I look at a lot um, in my research. Um, what effect do foreclosures have? Well, we need to take, make a distinction between types of crime, property or violent crime, and also certain contexts. Now, this is work um, from another graduate student of mine um, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. She had data on vacancy rates, and uh, crime, different crime rates. What effect do vacancies have on property crime? None. No effect at all. Again, this was quarterly data, looking at these as these processes play out quickly. Vacancy rate, though, for violent crime or drug crime, a big effect. And what you'll notice is sort of a threshold effect. It has a bit of an effect down here, but as the vacancy rate gets up towards 9 10%, sort of a threshold, things get a lot worse for these neighborhoods. When she broke it out by neighborhood context as in income, these are high income and average income neighborhoods, no effect of foreclosure, basically, pretty much flat. What about low income neighborhoods? Huge effect. Low income neighborhoods, the most vulnerable, foreclosures hit them, you see a huge spike in violent crimes. Something we need to know, something we need to be aware of when these things take place. Um, in our LA data, we didn't have data for crime in neighborhoods, but we could see at the city level, cities with more foreclosures had more crime. Uh, but, uh, but also cities who had more foreclosures in poverty areas had an even more uh, uh, violent crime. And again, that's consistent with those previous uh, the evidence from San Antonio. What about feedback effects from crime? This is something I've been spending a lot of time researching my, in my recent work. Um, that crime can actually have an impact on other things in our society, which is probably not terribly surprising, but not many people have looked at this. Um, in Southern California data, cities with higher violent crimes had a higher foreclosure rate, not at the neighborhood level, but we saw it at the city level. Um, but in addition, in some previous work I did, not from LA, but from uh, about 13 cities, one of the things I was looking at is what effect does violent crime have on um, occupancy rates, people leaving abandoned neighborhoods. Again, we see this sort of a threshold effect. 
that for neighborhoods with lower levels of violent crime, not much of an effect, but sort of a tipping point. When neighborhoods get higher, higher uh, violent crime rates, suddenly you see this real exodus. That's the, the occupancy rate going way down. So again, you see this impact that takes place. Um, so what do we take away from this brief presentation? Well, first to understand this social phenomenon, to address it, we need to understand it, first and foremost. Right? What do we do when these things take place? We need to understand all the different moving parts that are taking place. You know, it'd be nice to be a psychologist and be able to manipulate things and go into a uh, do a controlled experiment. We can't do that with these sorts of social processes. Um, different things take place when this happens. What do we learn from this? More foreclosures. We do see lower home values. We see lower neighborhood satisfaction. We see more residential mobility. We see more violent crime. So there is a definite impact there. But we also see evidence that problems can spread across neighborhoods. And again, like I said, the scale of it is quite wide. We weren't doing a real precise geographic thing, which I did in some of my other work. But we saw this real spreading effect going on. And what I want to suggest is that the ecological perspective that I'm trying to take here um, highlights these various interdependencies. Right? There's interdependencies spatially across neighborhoods. What happens in my neighbor's area matters to me, in a sense. But also this notion that crime can affect vacancies, but vacancies feed back in crime. And so you can get um, this feedback effect. Um, why do we care about this? Well, there will always be other storms coming down the road. There will be other crises. And like I said, it may well even be that the foreclosure crisis may be the only that had taken a pause at this point. Anyway, thank you so much for your time.